maybe if I come to Robbie first, uh, seeing as you have the sandbox, you clearly believe virtual land is super important. <laughs> um, like, just outline like, why that is and why you guys are so bullish on it. Sure. I think particularly with the sandbox, um, you know, the sandbox is a UGC or user generated content environment. So I think we're not just bullish on virtual land or real estate per se, mm -hmm. but it's really about creating a three dimensional online space where people can develop their own experiences. Because what we're really interested in is kind of starting the ball rolling, but then seeing what it is that, that people want to do with the space themselves. Um, so, I mean, whether you think of it in a sort of professional capacity where you have companies developing real estate, meaning developing game experiences or other types of entertainment experiences, or it's just anybody who comes into the sandbox and buys a plot of land and starts building cool stuff to show off to their friends. Um, so we want it to be a place for everybody, both companies and individuals, and just a place to have fun and most importantly, create cool stuff. So we kept it very, um, we kept the art style very simple and accessible, which hopefully, you know, means that everybody can, um, the, the creation ability is within everybody's grasp because, you know, there are beautiful 3D rendered spaces out there, but you need professional graphic artists and things to do that. So we wanted the sandbox to be accessible to as wide an audience as possible. Okay, and virtual world in, or virtual real estate, sorry, in theory allows you guys to do that. So Rich, you're kind of working on the footsteps, but maybe in mixed reality that, uh, well, maybe not necessarily Robbie, maybe we'll give Seb credit for the sandbox, that Seb is certainly uh, helping push forward. Like, does that resonate with you and make sense for how you're looking at uh, virtual land? Yes, very much so. And, you know, I love uh, what Animoca and Sandbox is doing. I think they've really revolutionized the creator aspect of the space. And, um, you know, again, what we're focused on at Superworld, and I think a differentiating factor for us is we're focused on people's reality. And again, people's reality to create, discover, and monetize anything anywhere in the real world. And so what we want to do is, again, empower creators, artists, educators, musicians, scientists, financial people, literally anyone to be able to create what they love and to be able to share those things and be able to monetize those things. We're really looking forward to building out an ecosystem that can empower people. And I think another really important thing for us at Superworld is how can we enhance and improve the real world? How can we utilize and leverage these technologies, AR, VR, blockchain, AI, to provide real benefits to the real world in, in, in ways that yeah. you know, I think can serve as a gateway to the to the metaverse for all these other amazing partners like Animoca and, and, and Republic Realm and IBM across consumer and enterprise. Nitin, maybe I could get your take on valuing virtual real estate because you're like, I'm going to say you come from the grown up world, like you've got a proper institutional background. You mentioned yeah. before we come on that you yeah. some of your team were looking at the possibility of NFTs as collateral. Um, It'd be great to understand if you'd value it in the same way that Janine's approaching it. Yeah, no, I think that's a great thing. In fact, I was telling uh, you know you guys earlier that I was woke up at two a.m. this morning to speak to one of the largest banks in the world, and the there are two elements to this. One is the starting point, which is the ability for the industry to tokenize real assets, which is not the virtual real estate, exactly similar to what Stablecoin had done for fiat, similar to the movement that you know trying to create a NFT for the physical assets and physical sort of real estate. And what banks are trying to figure out is what is the apparatus needed? What is the regulatory framework needed to be able to use that as a collateral? And I think my team and we have done some work in estimating that the non-bankable assets, this is basically the assets that the banks don't really have a traditional risk models to be able to do things like, you know, collateral and lending and so on and so forth is close to about $2.5 quadrillion that includes the existing NFT marketplaces. And so the question then becomes, is if the banks can start, financial institutions, regulated financial institutions can start with figuring out as to how do you use NFT as collateral and provide lending from traditional finance perspective. And that movement is going on, which is again, things like custody, things like risk models, things like, you know, providing lending both in terms of CBDC and stablecoin. But then also working with the regulators, which is the work that we kicked off, again, the recent work with President Working Group, 
as well as with what Europe has done with MyCar, which is the market infrastructure for crypto asset regulation based on MIFID, is treating NFT as an asset class and figuring out as to how do we be able to move this through the financial system. And I believe that the DeFi world can benefit from it as well, which is all the things that Aave has done for traditional crypto assets or financial crypto assets. Can we not then merge? And this is where I think the intersection of the metaverse economic systems becomes so much more interesting from our perspective. I know I've said a lot to unpack it, but I'll pause at that to see if that makes sense. There's something popping up in the chat that I think is is relevant to this, right? Like. Uh, Sasha, I think, is saying that he's been hanging around in the metaverse for quite some time and like, we're terrifying, right, as a group of five people. And my hunch is, and Sasha, please correct me if I'm wrong, that the reason that we're terrifying is because we come from institutional backgrounds where we aggregate capital and then we purchase land and then use that land as an asset, as opposed to uh, some more, I don't want to say egalitarian, but more idealistic communities where like a individual creator can buy a plot of land and you know, there's a, a way to prevent us at this table coming in and buying, you know, 8,000 parcels and, and owning the uh, the virtual real estate. Although um, I, did, I do think I used the word build cool stuff. <laughs> yep, you did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> well, in all of our defense. <laughs> but you also said... It's also, it's also a bit naive yeah. to assume that there aren't big financial backers behind a lot of the things you already know and love. I mean, in the video yeah. gaming space, for example, like Grand Theft Auto cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build. We don't hate on it because it costs a lot of money to make it. And you yeah. need access to institutional capital if we're ever going to have anything remotely like Ready Player One. Like it's not going to happen in some hacker's bedroom on a $25,000 bootstrapped budget and be that amazing immersive experience that we're all expecting from the metaverse. So I think what what's important, Sasha, and we do hear you, is that people like us need to make sure that we stay close to the ecosystem. Like I, I manage the fund, but I also have a team that's a lot younger than me that are active gamers that are in the metaverse that are a member of a zillion Telegram channels. So I know that maybe I'm terrifying, but I'll tell you why I'm not. Because I think investing, and especially at the venture and seed stage, is about seeing the future. You need a crystal ball, and I have one. That's because I have two children who spend all of their spare time playing in metaverse-based games, Minecraft and Roblox. And I see how they interact with it, and I understand that this is the future, and I don't want to destroy it, make it too corporate, fill it with advertisements, because I want it to be pure and, and this like web 3.0 experience for them because it's how they're going to interact with technology and the internet as adults. So I, I, I do hear you and I'm very sensitive to that fact, but my team is a bit, is, is much more comforting. I think a lot less financial focused and would make you happy if you met more of them. You know, to that point, I, I wanted to just uh, add that, you know, I, I hear kind of what the, the community is saying, and you know, I'm really fans of a lot of you know all the people here on this panel, and 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 what's what's happening on all all sides of that equation, on the consumer side, the builder side, the investment side, the enterprise side of of what's happening in the metaverse. I, I come personally from you know I start off my career in real estate investment banking at UBS, you know, on, on corporate side of that, um, and then you know my previous company is an entertainment studio, right? So kind of a builder side creating content. And I understand those those perspectives there. And I think the beauty of, of what we're building here in terms of the metaverse, things that Animoca is doing across all of their companies, all of the things that Republic is doing to support the ecosystem, helping developers come on board. Nitin's talking to banks, bringing that enterprise focus and, and you know utilizing this as technology for the real world. And at Super World, you know, I think what we're focused on is how can we bring all that stuff to real life? I think there were some questions in, in, the, in the panel earlier that was, uh, you know, asked re regarding, you know, relevance and what creates value here. And I think in our case, we're mapped on top of the real world. And so everything has this physical real world component to it. And we want to ameliorate the real world. We want to enhance people's real lives. And so, again, the creator side of that is very important because that's what's the basis of making something valuable besides the real world relevance of creating that that content or those experiences around you. So, I, you know, again, I, I think that once we examine this space, examine what's happening, it's going to be very positive for humanity. 
quite and and you know to that point i think you know we've spoken this about you know about this early on as well harish is that if you think about what you mentioned earlier uh, you know as as robby was talking about you're building an ecosystem they're building you're trying to introduce transparency and it's not just about the corporate and the traditional finance world it is still funding these projects with the crypto assets and i think at some point we are building a network which is preserving value transferring value and sort of appreciating value even in the virtual world and virtual land that we create so i think the purity of that network of of this infrastructure that we are building has to come from transparent movement of value which is what is will make this infrastructure sustain you know sustain on the long run which is what robbie was talking about earlier uh, so I'll, i'll stop at that I think also when when we look at it, you know, just with most of our our, our sort of metaverse experiences, we're always focused because we're game developers. So our mindset is always on having the largest possible audience because that's kind of in our DNA is trying to get the most people in the world to possibly play our game. Um so accessibility not just from a look and feel and style point of view, but also from a cost perspective is very important because the more expensive stuff is the more limited your addressable market is and we want everybody to be have accessibility to to the product um, and i think to janine's point you know there are going to be investors like like her fund for example who are acquiring real estate in the metaverse um, but at the same time they will likely want to work with very creative people to create cool stuff on their real estate because it makes their real estate more valuable if they provide if they enhance the experience in the metaverse rather than just sitting on their property and leaving it as a vacant lot you know because that real world analogy really does apply in the metaverse as well in my opinion